I know we're going to start out pretty sad, but am I wrong to say that I'm kind of relieved that we made it to this part? It's just that I can't wait for all those defunct land comparisons to be done and, uh, oh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the second half of the 1980s were some of the toughest times for Jim Henson. After consecutively creating successful projects, rather they be with the Muppets or not, he had his first failure in years, both critically and financially, with his highly ambitious movie, Labyrinth. The flop was so emotionally crushing for Jim that he was having a hard time trying to make a new project work. Technically, the closest he ever got to that was with a series called The Storyteller, which was critically acclaimed, but was also very short-lived due to low ratings. And what was worse, not even Kermit and the gang were able to help him get back on top. When they tagged along on his new variety show called The Jim Henson Hour, it consequentially left a stain to their once golden reputation, since that series flopped shortly after it started. Understandably, Jim became fed up with dealing with all of the failures and the unpleasant business aspects of his job thus leading him to trying to sell the Muppets and almost all of his works to the Walt Disney Company. This would have been the perfect plan for Henson if it weren't for Disney's executives, lawyers, and accountants always demanding more from him for less. So yeah, that ended up causing more problems than solutions. But then, suddenly, the unthinkable happened. What was thought by everyone, including Jim himself, to be a minor inconvenience from a little sickness turned out to be something more serious that resulted in the worst outcome. On May 16th, 1990, at 1.21 a.m. Good evening. What talent, what genius, what a loss. Sammy Davis Jr., dead of cancer at the age of 64, and Jim Henson, the creator of the Muppets, dead of pneumonia at age 53. The death of puppeteer Jim Henson today was unexpected. And then there was the death of Jim Henson. It came as a big surprise yesterday. The Sesame Street creator died of an advanced stage of pneumonia yesterday. Well, Lisa, I feel as if I've lost my best friend because, in fact, I've lost several. Kermit the Frog, for one, and Ernie from Sesame Street. He died at the New York hospital at the age of 53. Word quickly spread about the news, and the heart of everyone that was close to him, both in his professional and personal life, was shattered. But along with this devastation, there was also confusion as to what was the source of Jim's unexpected death. Was it the heartache from his failed projects like Labyrinth, The Storyteller, and The Jim Henson Hour? Was it the pressure of the Disney deal and how it was not going as well as he thought? Or was it his Christian science background that allegedly prevented him from getting the medication he needed that probably would have prevented this moment? In reality, the answer is more complex than what anyone expected. What actually killed Jim was septic shock due to Group A Streptococcus, where bacteria infected his organs, especially his lungs, with so much toxins that it caused them to overinflate and then collapse his entire system. Even before stepping into the hospital, the damage that was already done by the bacteria was critical. As his body became progressively weaker, he was coughing out blood, and his pains were becoming more prominent. Five days after his death, a public memorial service was held at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. Many of his colleagues, friends, family, and even some Muppets all came together to reminisce about their times with Jim, say their final goodbyes, and perform some of Henson's favorite songs throughout his life. I am green, and it'll do fine. It's beautiful, and I think it's what I want to be. Thank you, Kermit. Most interesting of this service, as part of the request on Jim's will, was that everyone was advised to dress in colors and not wear black, as Jim wanted to view funerals as a celebratory vision of life, no matter how sad the circumstance. But with the entertainment icon no longer alive, there was one question that everyone had in the back of their minds. 
What will happen to the Muppets? At the time, no one was sure, but the answer wouldn't be revealed until November of that year with the special The Muppets Celebrate Jim Henson, where they all come together and have their own memorial service of sorts as they, and some special guests, look back at the life and accomplishments of the man who made them famous and the impact that he left on the world. You know, this Jim Henson may be gone, but well, maybe he's still here too, inside us, believing in us. Actually, not all the Muppets were featured, because throughout the special, there was one who was noticeably missing, Kermit the Frog. It was a very difficult decision on who should take Kermit's place, or even if anyone should perform as the frog at all, because he isn't just another popular Muppet, he was Jim Henson's alter ego, the one piece of him that stayed alive after his death. The Henson family, including his former wife Jane and their five children, along with some of the people who worked with him over the years, had several tough discussions about it, along with what to do with the rest of Jim's legacy. Knowing the man he was, he wouldn't want the Muppets and all those he loved to stop just because he's no longer there. If they wanted to truly honor him, they would continue to spread joy and entertain people in the wacky way they know best. On top of one of his sons, Brian, and then later alongside his sister Lisa, leading Jim's company, they also decided that the person who should have Kermit on their arms and give him his voice was longtime Muppet performer Steve Whitmire, whom at first couldn't handle the pressure of taking the role of Jim's most iconic creation. It was really funny when I made eye contact with him that first time. Uh, it was like he was saying, well, come on, talk, you know, say something. And uh, I just was freaked out. I couldn't do it. So I took the puppet and put it in another room and I don't think I picked it up for about a month. The reason Steve had a hard time was it's just not doing another character. It's he had to get in the soul of Jim to be Kermit. Eventually, he found the courage to work with Kermit and the frog officially made his debut with his new partner at the end of the special. Well, that just about brings us down to the end of another one, but before we go, let me thank you for being with us for our tribute to Jim Henson. And we'll be seeing you soon with more Muppet stuff, because that's the way the boss would want it. And at that moment, the Hensons and the Muppets made sure that this promise was kept. Once they got back to business, they returned to the Walt Disney Company and tried to settle that difficult deal. Ultimately, because Jim's death complicated the entire matter, the deal evaporated by the end of 1990. Along with helping them on the development and distribution of their sitcom Dinosaurs, the only thing they were able to agree upon was that Disney could complete Henson's final project he worked on, Muppet Vision 3D, which opened its doors at Disney MGM Studios in Walt Disney World exactly a year after his passing. However, at the same time, the Muppets were at work on their most important project yet. Not only would it be their first movie in years, but it would be the ultimate test to determine if they were still able to entertain audiences without Jim Henson. And that movie was The Muppet Christmas Carol, based on the classic novel by Charles Dickens. Now, before we look into this holiday classic, I just want to go and quickly talk about the sponsor of this part, Disney Emoji Blitz. Now, this isn't any regular Match 3 mobile game. This is an action-packed Match 3 game in which each character has their own unique ability in order to go and spice up your strategy. And this literally has hundreds of characters from across the Disney universe, including those from their movies, TV shows, attractions, other games, and from their big name franchises like from Pixar, Star Wars, and yes, even the Muppets. In fact, the Muppets actually have some solid representation in this game, even to the point of having some special versions, including from Muppets Haunted Mansion and Muppet Christmas Carol. Not to mention that they update this regularly in order to keep the game fresh and exciting. In fact, to celebrate Disney's 100, Disney Emoji Blitz is releasing a platinum emoji of a beloved Disney character every month. And trust me, these platinum emojis are worth having in your collection. So, you want to join in the fun? 
Then download the game now for free on the iOS and Android. Actually, to make things easier for you, you can also go and scan the QR code or check out the link in the description. Big thanks to Disney Emoji Bliss for sponsoring this part. And now with that said and done, I believe it is now time that we get back to our story. It's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, the most hated person in London who only cares about money and opposes the thought of having empathy for others and the holiday season. On the night of Christmas Eve, he was warned by the spirits of his former business partners, the Marley Brothers, that he will be visited by three ghosts, and that he must reject his hate-filled attitude or else he would be punished for eternity once he enters the afterlife. Now Scrooge will have to travel with the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and yet to come, and watch his entire life alongside them so that he can learn the error of his ways and bring out the heart that he locked inside him for most of his existence. During his final years, Jim Henson contemplated about making a fourth Muppet movie. Back in the mid-1980s, while he received concepts that he thought wouldn't work well, his writing partner, Jerry Jewell, developed an idea called the cheapest Muppet movie ever made, where Gonzo was making a ludicrous adventure film and spent half of the budget on the opening sequence alone. As a result, the Muppets resort to using cheaper and cheaper tactics to progress the film until the very end, where they received an exuberant amount of money thanks to sponsors. Henson loved Jewell's idea, and after finishing up A Muppet Family Christmas, Jim, Jerry, and Frank Oz spent some time turning that into a full script. Even when his priorities shifted towards other projects such as the Jim Henson Hour or the Disney deal, he would still spend some time discussing with Jewel about the movie. Sadly, when Henson passed away, the chances of the cheapest Muppet movie ever made coming to life were lost with him. After the death, Brian Henson had a call with his agent, Bill Haber, about making something different that the company could do for another Muppet movie that his father hadn't done before, and the agent proposed a film adaptation of A Christmas Carol. Quickly after the call, Haber informed Brian that he just sold the idea to ABC to turn it into a TV movie. Originally, it was going to be a more straightforward parody of the book, and the ghosts would have been played by the recognizable Muppets, including either Robin, Scooter, or Fozzie as the Ghost of Christmas Past, Miss Piggy as the Ghost of Christmas Present, and either Gonzo or Animal as the Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come. However, as they were getting familiar with the source material, the team fell in love with what they were reading and decided to switch up their approach to be more sophisticated and more respectful to the original story. Their first action for that initiative was having the ghosts be original Muppets who are presented exactly like how Dickens described them. Well, I'm usually trustworthy. <laughs> as for the famous Muppets, while most were placed as cameos amongst the 280 Muppets featured in the film due to the limited amount of significant characters in the story, the main ones were cast in the roles that suited them best. Kermit was an obvious choice for Bob Cratchit, which then led to having Miss Piggy as his wife Emily, and Robin as their youngest child, Tiny Tim. Fozzie's name alone makes him the perfect candidate for Fezziwig. And Stadler and Waldorf have the most parallels to Scrooge, making them the right candidates for both to play the Jacob Marley role. And then there was Gonzo, whom Jerry Jewell decided to make him do something that might have never been done before in any other Christmas Carol adaptation. Jewell loved Dickens' style of writing, and he wanted to directly take his words and implement them onto the movie, thus having Charles Dickens himself appear as the narrator of the tale. The reason why Gonzo was chosen for the role was not because he was the ideal choice, but instead the opposite. How he was the least likely to take on this role adds to the Muppet-like comedy of their adaptation, as around 95% of his lines are directly from the book, and Rizzo was thrown in as his sidekick for some extra laughs. Welcome to the Muppet Christmas Carol. I am here to tell the story. And I am here for the food. Of course, not everyone in the picture has to be a Muppet, and they knew since the beginning that Ebenezer Scrooge had to be played by a real person. After they rejected the comedic approach, they wanted a well-respected actor who could convincingly play the part and highlight the Dickens style of the feature. And the first man they asked was Michael Caine, who not only said yes,
but also told Brian, and I'll let him say it to avoid making a bad Michael Caine impression. I'm going to play this as if I'm doing A Christmas Carol with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I'm going to be utterly committed and dramatic, and I'm never even going to wink at the fact that these are puppets around me. On a side note, this marks as the first time in Kane's career where he took on a role that required him to sing, a talent that not even Michael himself knew that he was able to do. As production began at Shepperton Studios in England, 28-year-old Brian Henson was faced with his toughest challenge yet, with not only developing what is technically the comeback of the Muppets after his father's death, but also his directorial debut. Over the years, outside of helping his dad with movies like The Great Muppet Caper, Labyrinth, and The Witches, he worked his way up to become a director, gradually gaining experience like being a second unit director for the 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie, and taking the helm of some of the episodes of Jim Henson's Mother Goose stories, which he won an Emmy for. However, directing The Muppet Christmas Carol was an intimidating task, even for an experienced director especially with its tight nine-week filming schedule during the summer of 1992 and a minimal budget of around $15 million. Not to mention that the pressure got bigger when Walt Disney Pictures stepped in and decided to distribute the movie to theaters instead of television. And yet, Brian led the project with ease, making sure that the combination of the Dickens Order and the Muppet Chaos can work together to create the Muppets' biggest holiday adventure. In fact, he did his directing job so well that Michael Caine was surprised that this was his first time helming a movie. As it is a more effects-heavy feature, the team brought on board Paul Gentry as the visual effects supervisor, along with additional assistance from the computer film company. Among all the effects, ranging from the simple that are commonly found in Muppet projects, to the technically complex like the mechanics of the Ghost of Christmas Present, there are some that stand out as more unique to this picture. One of them was the Ghost of Christmas Past, where they thought about submerging her in 50,000 gallons of oil to capture her ethereal presence. They almost went with it, but instead of oil, they used a tank of water. There was one other effect though that Brian did that was reminiscent to what his father did when he started making movies. He wanted to continue what Jim began by having Kermit be featured in a shot that innovated the use of puppetry, like when he rode his bicycle in the Muppet movie. That moment was the shot when Kermit and Robin were dancing and singing on their way back home on Christmas night. It's a season when the saints can employ us. Fa la la, to spread the news about peace and to keep love alive. To make that shot work, not only was Steve Whitmire and Jerry Nelson puppeteering their characters, but a couple of others had to be there to work on Kermit's legs and his free hand, which the shot was later composited on a scene showing a street that the camera slowly backed away from. And what was more difficult to pull off was the ground that Kermit literally walks on, which was actually a four-foot diameter barrel with cobblestones that had snow glued on them. For the music, Henson hired Miles Goodman to compose the score, who previously worked on several of Frank Oz's films, and brought back Jim's old musical friend Paul Williams for the songs, who was going through a tough time for a few years and was encouraged to return to make the Muppet Christmas Carol his comeback. Out of all the songs that Williams wrote, three of them never made it in the final film. There was Room in Your Heart, which would have been sung by Dr. Bunsen Honeydew and Beaker, Chairman of the Board, sung by Sam the Eagle, and then there was When Love Is Gone. This was sung by Belle as she was breaking up with Scrooge due to his greed when watching a vision of his past. For Brian, this song was essential for the movie, especially when one of the last songs of the film is like a partner of it called When Love Is Found. However, then chairman of Walt Disney Pictures, Jeffrey Katzenberg, demanded to cut it out because he felt like the kids wouldn't like it. While the song was deleted from the movie's theatrical release, it did, however, found its way on some of the home media releases, including the original 1993 VHS and Laserdisc, which the latter contained the only widescreen edition of the scene for several years. Later, Henson did try to remaster the number, 
But sadly, Disney lost the original film negatives, leaving the source of the song to be as dead as a doornail. As the movie was prepped up for release, the team knew that the first thing that must be shown was a tribute, as the opening credits begin with a dedication to Jim Henson and Richard Hunt, whom the latter passed away on January of 1992 due to HIV-related complications. When the Muppets return to the big screen for the holidays on December 11th, 1992, the results of the movie were… okay. It wasn't an admirable achievement, but it did not fail. Critics found that it wasn't the best Christmas Carol adaptation that they saw, nor did they consider this the Muppets' best movie, but for what it is, they felt that this was a decent kid-friendly version of the story. As for the box office, that too was also considered a passable effort, as it accumulated $27.3 million domestically. Maybe it could have gotten more, but it was up against some major competition at the time like Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, and Disney's Aladdin. Over the years, as the film got re-released several times on home media and received airtime on television during the holiday season, the Muppet Christmas Carol gradually gathered a following, and the love for the movie grew significantly larger. Nowadays, the love for this movie has become so big that millions of people have included this film as a staple to their annual holiday watch list, and it was re-evaluated from being considered just okay to often being named the greatest film adaptation of A Christmas Carol. As for the deleted song When Love Is Gone, who did not die? Oh, isn't that swell? Brian Henson revealed in 2020 that Disney archivists found the film negatives that featured the entire song. And with it, on December 9th, 2022, around the time of the movie's 30th anniversary, Disney released a full version of the feature with the song on Disney Plus in 4K. Although there is something worth mentioning here because the way that Disney set this up is a little bit weird. You can't just go to the Muppet Christmas Carol on Disney Plus and then hit play. What you gotta do in order to watch the entire movie, including When Love Is Gone, then when you're at the Muppet Christmas Carol on Disney Plus, you gotta go to extras and you pick the third option in which they call it the full length version. That, and you can also choose if you want to just watch the song by itself, which is the second option. Just thought I'd mention that so that you could take note of it the next time the holiday season comes. For most people, this movie is a holiday classic and one of their go-to adaptations for their Christmas Carol fix. But for the team who made the film, this was so much more. This was the first Muppet production that we made after my father, Jim Henson, died. And it was, uh, it, it was a real coming together of the group and the, and the company. And I think for that reason, the film will probably be a very important film to us and to the Muppets. It was a promise to Jim that they would continue the Muppets without him that they were able to still come together and play around with Kermit, Miss Piggy, Fozzie, Gonzo, Rizzo, and more so that they can make audiences laugh, cry, and have fun with the Muppets for the generations beyond Jim's lifetime. And what better way to accomplish that mission than with an extra dose of Christmas spirit? When Jim Henson passed away, they thought that the love was gone. But thanks to the help of this movie, they found that love through the Muppets, and it was a moment that could be best described as something that feels like Christmas. While it wasn't the Muppets' biggest success, it was still a success regardless, and it was just enough to encourage the team to get started on an encore. They played around with several fairy tales with the 1994 direct-to-home media film Muppet Classic Theater, but for their next big movie, instead of spreading Christmas cheer by using Charles Dickens' book, they took the pages of Robert Louis Stevenson and set sail on Muppet Treasure Island. It's about a boy named Jim Hawkins, along with his friends Gonzo and Rizzo, who received a map to a treasure beyond their wildest dreams that once belonged to the notorious Captain Flint, and swore to never let it be in the hands of pirates who want the riches for themselves. To ensure that they get to the treasure first, 
the boys get on board the Hispaniola, led by Captain Abraham Smollett, and the kid then befriends the cook of the ship, Long John Silver. However, Silver has a dark secret that he and some of the crew on deck are actually the pirates that Jim was warned about. So now Hawkins, Smollett, and his team are on a swashbuckling race against Silver and his pirates, as Captain Flint's treasure awaits them where the X marks the spot. The project began when Kirk Thatcher was brought on board to help Jerry Jewell to write the next movie after the years of work he did for the company, co-producing and writing some projects like the series Dinosaurs. Now, I'm not saying he hates the movie, but he really didn't like how the Muppet Christmas Carol made the Muppets look like their entertainment value was geared more towards kids. So, for their next picture, he proposed that they would do a period piece where they can really play up both the comedy and the action, and suggested that they could either do a King Arthur story where they would feature knights and dragons, or an adaptation of Treasure Island. From the influence with how it went with A Christmas Carol, the team chose the latter, as they could see the Robert Louis Stevenson story be a better fit for the Muppets. By the way, do you want to know something interesting? Originally, they were thinking about giving Gonzo and Rizzo the Jim Hawkins role, where they would have split the role into two, where one would play as Jim and the other would play as Hawkins. Now, as funny as that probably could have been, there was just one problem. That would have honestly taken away the heart of the story. Considering that an integral part of Treasure Island is the coming of age arc of Jim. So, just like what they did last time with Muppet Christmas Carol, they decided to go and give the role to a human actor. And out of the 100 kids who went and auditioned for the part, the one who got it was actually the first to try it out, Kevin Bishop. As for Gonzo and Rizzo, well, they didn't want to go and give up their leading parts. So what they did was that they created new roles so that they can go and play as Jim's best friends called, well, Gonzo and Rizzo. Who's everybody? I'm an orphan. I've got no family. Hey, you got us. Yeah, we're family. As for the mutinous Long John Silver, they decided to go with who they originally considered for Ebenezer Scrooge in the last picture before moving away from the parody angle, Tim Curry. With a voice that impersonates his grandfather and one leg sometimes tied up to his back to make it look like he has, well, one leg, Tim took on the challenge of matching up with the Muppets' massive energy. How does a Muppet performer get to be a star performer? And the truth is, it's a competition. We are not respectful of each other at all. Like, most actors are very respectful. Okay, they've, they're front and center, and now we look at them. Muppet's completely different. If you can upstage and get the front stage, if you can get the attention, you win. And I think probably everybody feels like that, because, you know, the, the Muppets have um, carte blanche. <laughs> you know, like kids, they can say what's on their mind. However, even with the right story, that doesn't mean adapting it the Muppet way into a film script was easy. It took both Jerry Jewell and Kirk Thatcher around nine months to a year of writing before screenwriter James Hard was called in to join them. It took so long that Brian Henson vowed to never cut his hair until the script was finished. As you can see, it grew to the point that it reached his back. It wasn't really much of a... Uh incentive for me because I thought I looked good long here. As the filmmakers returned to Shepperton Studios for their 14-week filming schedule, the film took up a lot more space than last time, taking over seven whole stages with 13 intricate sets, crafted by a team led by production designer Val Strazovec, including a complete inn, an entire seaport, a beach with 200,000 gallons of surf and palm trees, large sections of the island, and some of the interior of the boat. But even with all that space, they still had to do some tricks in order to make the adventure look as big as the ocean itself with forced perspective designs, more than what was done in The Muppet Christmas Carol. In fact, their biggest challenge was building the Hispaniola, as it not only had to be crafted for both the actors and the Muppets in mind, but it was also set up on a computer-driven gimbal so that the crew could control the boat's movements, giving the illusion that it's traveling the seas with an entire crew of Muppets commanding the deck. 
But with all that motion, Brian was worried if that could cause the cast to get seasick. So, as a precaution, he gave each of them some Dramamine to prepare for filming. However, that turned out to be counterintuitive because not only the gimbal didn't cause people to get seasick, but they instead got sleepy from the tablet. And I don't think a bunch of tired pirates would make an exciting movie. I don't know whether you've taken Dramamine, but it doesn't do much for pace. But the biggest technical challenge for this feature was the Love Let Us Here scene, where Captain Smollett and Benjamina, played by Kermit and Miss Piggy respectively, are hanging upside down as they sing their love ballad. It was a scene that was said to be so tough to pull off that not even Brian wanted to talk about the details. And Kermit and Piggy hanging upside down, very, very tricky scene to do. That was a really hard scene to do. I won't even talk about how hard really that one was. If you watch it, you can just see if, if you know anything about puppets, it's really difficult. There's strings everywhere to, to work the hands, and then we had to get rid of the strings later, and then the close-ups are puppeteers upside down, and, you know, it's all just, it's, it was very difficult. But if I may take an educated guess on what happened, while Kermit and Miss Piggy looked like this, the rest of the crew making the scene looked like this. Among those who were performing the colorful cast of over 400 characters, one of them made his Muppet debut with this film. Bill Beretta joined the Jim Henson team in 1991 by working as the body performer of Earl in Dinosaurs, along with working on some of their other projects in the 90s like Jim Henson's Animal Show and Mr. Willoughby's Christmas Tree. In Muppet Treasure Island, he was assigned to take on the roles of Jacques Roach, Mr. Bit, and the Swedish Chef, along with some of the film's original characters like Angel Marie and Clueless Morgan. Give it to him! Yeah! But, um, uh, it's not even his birthday. No, 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 the paper! Uh -oh. But there were those who were kind of absent during production as well. Due to his packed schedule caused by his directing career, Frank Oz wasn't available to perform as his characters. The best that he was able to do was provide the voices of Miss Piggy, Fozzie, Sam, and Animal, and let Kevin Clash puppeteer them with those recordings. Then again, for some of the bigger musical numbers like Sailing for Adventure and Cabin Fever, they hired 25 additional puppeteers for the shots that require over 40 Muppets to appear at the same time. Speaking of the numbers, they brought in songwriting duo Barry Mann and Cynthia Well to create the picture songs, as well as inviting Hans Zimmer to compose the score. Getting into the Muppet mentality, as well as understanding the mood of the moment for each number. Even before knowing who would play the human roles like Jim Hawkins and Long John Silver. A few months before the release, the company found itself in some trouble when the Hormel Foods Corporation sued them because of the name of the chief of the native island pigs. I am Spat Am, High Priest of the Boars. However, it only took a couple of months for the judge to dismiss the case entirely. To which he noted, one might think Hormel would welcome the association with a genuine source of pork. As the movie was ready to sail for adventure in theaters, additional content was produced to help promote the feature, including a direct-to-home media Muppet sing-along, a computer game by Activision, and a making-of documentary special on the Disney Channel. And when it was released on February 16th, 1996, the treasure they found was... adequate. Similarly to The Muppet Christmas Carol, critics mildly enjoyed the picture, stating that it's a fun movie with some good laughs and enjoyable performances like from Tim Curry, but the writing could have used some improvement. And at the box office, the film made a little more than before with a domestic total of $34.3 million. An okay sum, considering that it was up against Broken Arrow and Happy Gilmore on its release. While its legacy may not have been as golden as Christmas Carol, it did broaden the range of the Muppets' capabilities, leading them to places and adventures that they've never been before. Thanks to their version of Treasure Island, they were able to cross oceans, engage in swashbuckling sword fights, add more unforgettable songs to their musical collection, and best of all, the Muppets finally got to team up with Tim Curry. Even if they tried to somewhat follow the book, 
the team was sailing to who knows where with this picture and made sure that everything we love about the Muppets is all here so that it could live on as a fan favorite, even if they're not all there. After producing a couple of features presenting audiences that the Muppets were still alive and well, there was just one more task that they must accomplish in order to prove themselves that they could continue the Muppet legacy without Jim Henson. Create a new Muppet show. Making a movie or two was one thing, but would they be able to recreate that Muppet mayhem in the medium that Jim mastered? They all knew that it was an intimidating challenge, but it was still an essential step to take for Kermit and his friends to continue entertaining audiences just like Jim wished for. Instead of playing the music and lighting the lights, they got a show for you, guaranteed brand new, with Muppets Tonight. Combining elements of The Muppet Show and The Jim Henson Hour, The Muppets put on a variety show in their new TV studio. However, as Kermit is hard at work as the producer and trying to control all the chaos that surrounds him, he hired Clifford to be the host, taking center stage as he presents audiences the sketches, musical numbers, and guest stars. Just like before with Muppet Treasure Island, one of the goals of the series was to show that the Muppets were not geared exclusively for kids, and Kirk Thatcher once again took charge of that initiative this time as both a writer and supervising producer. For Muppets Tonight, Kirk advocated for an edgier style of comedy, not only to give older audiences a laugh, but to also be capable of competing with other popular shows at the time like Ren and Stimpy and South Park, whose fame were thanks largely part to how they continuously pushed the envelope of what they could do on television. In fact, it was kind of Kirk's promise to Jim himself that he wouldn't let the Muppets be viewed the same way as Sesame Street, even if it meant to fight his way to keep them away from being safe. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Jim, what's wrong? I just forgot what a form-fitting uniform you have. As many of the beloved Muppets made their television comeback, Along with those joining the main Muppet team, like Clifford and Bean Bunny, some made their television debut with this series, like Andy and Randy, Miss Piggy's dim-witted nephews who first appeared in Muppet Classic Theater, and Clueless Morgan and Polly from Muppet Treasure Island. Oh, give me a home where the blah roam, and the deep... At the same time, joining the familiar faces were an entire list of new characters, some of which would go on to become a regular in the Muppet team. Some of the more notable ones include Big Mean Carl, a monster who loves to eat literally anything he sees, Bobo, the security guard of the studio, Dr. Phil Van Neuter, the mad scientist during the Tales of the Vet sketches, Johnny Fiamma, the croon singer who is often seen alongside his assistant, a chimpanzee named Sal, Mr. Poodle Pants, the fashion designer, and the elevator operating duo, Seymour and Pepe the King Prawn. I'm Seymour, I'm Pepe, we're two of a kind, I'm a little bit forward, and I've got a big behind. Originally, they thought about making Pepe a mouse, and while it would have made sense to have that elephant and mouse dynamic with Seymour, they later realized that it was too easy and wanted to change that up. While brainstorming for new characters for the show, Bill Beretta had an idea for one that was based on his wife's aunt, who had a thick accent and always kept ending her sentences with okay. However, instead of saying that she was a little selfish, a slip of the tongue caused Bill to say that she was a little shellfish, resulting in the debut of the Muppet Sassy Crustacean. Oh, oh, flavor, flavor. No, 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 no. You see, I'm a prawn. If people think I got flavor, they're gonna dip me in cocktail sauce, okay? Just like in The Muppet Show, there are some sketches that were exclusive to UK due to the country's lack of commercials during the program. However, unlike before where the extended spots were filled with additional musical numbers, these were recurring sketches that were only available in the UK version. They include Fairy Tale PD, where Clifford and Bobo are cops in a fairy tale world, 
Mr. Callahan, which looks into Polly and Clueless Morgan's bar from the viewpoint of Mr. Callahan, Swift Wits, a game show where the contestants try to guess the secret word before Big Mean Carl eats a cute animal, and The Tubmans of Porksmith, which is about the adventures of a bureaucratic pig named Howard Tubman and his butler. When Muppets Tonight went on the air almost a month after Muppet Treasure Island on March 8, 1996 with the episode featuring Michelle Pfeiffer, it seemed to start out okay. Maybe it didn't get the best reviews. I've got an incredible discovery. You know, what's that? When you watch this show, it hurts! <laughs> <laughs> but they were sitting comfortably at the start of ABC. That was until they had to switch channels. Despite ABC ordering 13 episodes, only 10 of them aired during the TV season. Afterwards, the show was picked up by the Disney Channel, where they not only put up the three missing episodes, but ordered nine new episodes for a second season, including a clip show episode. However, that was pretty much it after that, as the series stopped around two years later with two seasons and 22 episodes. But it did end up winning an Emmy and earn an additional nomination. The final episode aired on February 8, 1998, fittingly about Johnny Fiamma leaving his mother's house. And, and I'm never coming back, Ma. Oh. oh. Never coming back. Oh, wait. Wait, Johnny. Oh, my Johnny. Yeah. And you know what else? <laughs> See, the reason for its sudden end was actually because of new management that was at ABC. Back then, they hired a new president called Jamie Tarsus, and she was known to make a very successful run where she actually developed many of NBC's biggest shows, such as Frasier, Mad About You, Friends, and many more. When Jamie was in charge, she wanted to go and attract the target demographic of men between the ages of 18 and 35. And that just so happens to be the toughest demographic for the Muppets to get. Now, they could attract many other target demographics just fine. Kids, definitely easy. Adults with families, they can enjoy the Muppets as well. But when it comes to young adults who are either starting college or they would start a family, that becomes a little bit more difficult in order to attract. And because that was one of the Muppets' weaker points, that's when Jamie and ABC told Muppets Tonight, well, good night. It was certainly no Muppet Show, but Muppets Tonight played a significant role in keeping the Muppet spirit alive. Regardless of what happened, the show still left a strong impact where some of the Muppets who debuted here are now prominent members and often stand alongside some of the big stars like Kermit. And say what you will about Muppets Tonight, it still had a better fate than another Jim Henson show that aired around the same time on the same channel, Aliens in the Family. We don't need a bigger house. We just need to get along together and love each other like a real that family. That is tedious moralizing. Okay, brother. And the less we talk about that show, the better. After several years of getting help from the Walt Disney Company to finance and distribute their projects since the passing of Jim, the Muppets took their next movie both out of Disney and out of this world, where they would go on an unexpected journey to find a new place that they could call their new home. But then again... They'll be back. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this special chapter, then make sure to give this a like and subscribe to my channel for more parts to come. I'll say now that this won't be the last time you'll hear about Disney, but before they come back, the Muppets are gonna go through a wild experience, and I'm not just talking about their next movie. So, until next time, see you later, dudes. You know, this show is beginning to roll. So is the motorbike. <laughs>